IELTS Listening, Model Test 1. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1 on page 236. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between Mark Winston, who wants to learn Japanese, and Kathy Green, who is a receptionist at the World Language Academy. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3 on page 236. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, may I help you? Yes, I'm Mark Winston and I... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Winston. World Language Academy, this is Kathy Green, may I help you? No, this is a private language school, not a travel agency. No problem at all. Goodbye. I'm sorry, Mr. Winston. Now may I help you? Yes, I hope you can. I'd like to sign up now for a Japanese class next week. The man says he'd like to sign up now, which means register today for a language class. The number two has been written in the blank. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Good morning, may I help you? Yes, I'm Mark Winston and I... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Winston. World Language Academy, this is Kathy Green, may I help you? No, this is a private language school, not a travel agency. No problem at all, goodbye. I'm sorry, Mr. Winston, now may I help you? Yes, I hope you can. I'd like to sign up now for a Japanese class next week. Classes start next week, and we have lots of Japanese classes to choose from. Have you studied Japanese before? No, I haven't. I'm a beginner. I'm planning to visit Japan next summer, so I want to learn a bit of the language. That's great. Japan is a wonderful place to visit. I spent a month in Tokyo last year, actually, and I even climbed Mount Fujiyama. Really? That's too much activity for me. I'm just planning to visit Tokyo. I think I'll find plenty to do there. You certainly will. All right, then, let me tell you a bit about our classes. They're all taught by native speakers, and they're all specialists in their field. You can choose a Japanese for tourists class, Japanese for business travelers, or Japanese for university students. You're not studying at a university, are you? No, I graduated a few years ago. Well, then, the tourist class is probably best for you. Yes, I think you're right. I just want to learn enough to order food in restaurants and go shopping and things like that. When does the Japanese for tourist class begin? Let's see. We have a class for beginners that starts next week. I think there are still a few spaces left. You're in luck. We have 15 students enrolled and there's room for three more. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10 on pages 237 and 238. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. When does that class meet? 
every Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 5.30 until 7.30. That's a bit early for me. I work until 6. Don't you have a class that starts later in the evening? No, not for beginners. Let's see. We have an afternoon class on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 1 to 3. Oh, but that's an intermediate class. What about mornings? We have a beginner's class that meets five days a week, Monday through Friday, from 9 a.m. until 10 a.m. Could you do that? No, I work all day. I only have evenings and weekends free. The advanced class is Tuesday and Thursday from 7.30 to 9.30, but you've never studied Japanese before, have you? No, I don't know anything about it. Well, we have a beginner's class on Saturday from 9 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon. Nine until two, that's a long class. We also have private tutors. Actually, I usually recommend private tutors because they give you individualized attention. You're the only student in the class, so the tutor teaches you according to your specific needs. It really is the best way to learn a language. It sounds great. I'd learn a lot that way, wouldn't I? You really would. And it's very convenient you can arrange to meet with your tutor at whatever time suits you. Fantastic. How do I sign up? Well, how many hours a week do you want to study? We usually recommend three to five hours a week for a minimum of four weeks. Okay, I'll start with three hours a week. Great. You can send us a check to cover the first week of classes, or you can pay now by credit card. Three hours of private classes comes out to $300, plus a $25 registration fee. $300? That's $100 a class. And it's certainly worth it. You'll be studying with a native speaker of Japanese. And all our tutors are professionally trained in the latest teaching methods. You'll be getting the best instruction money can buy. But $100 a class, that's over $1,000 for a month of classes. I'm sorry, but I just can't do that. Then take the Saturday class. It's only $300 a month. And it's small. There will be only four or five students in it. Great, I'll take that class. Can I pay by check? Yes. Just bring your check to the first class. See you next Saturday at 9 o'clock. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 238. Section 2. You will hear a guided tour of an old mansion. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13 on page 238. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 13. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Wilson, and I will be your guide for today's tour of Sumner Mansion. As a reminder before we begin, we ask that you not take photographs inside the building, and please turn off your cell phones during the tour. Also, we request that you refrain from eating as well as drinking inside the mansion. Refreshments will be available at the end of the tour in the cafe next to the garden. Before you hear the rest of the tour, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20 on page 239.
Now listen and answer the questions 14 to 20. Now to begin, here we are at the main entrance. You will notice the elaborate Italian frieze installed by the original owner when the mansion was built in 1810. To the left of the entrance is the main living room. This was used by the Sumner family for entertaining guests, particularly for their tea parties. They were famous for the tea parties that they gave in this room. Here on display you can see the elegant chinaware they used for their parties. There are several sets of china imported from abroad. Let's go over to the other side now. This room to the right of the main entrance is the dining room. Of course, the family meals were served here, but the most interesting thing about this room is the art. The Sumners collected a lot of art, and some of the finest pieces of their art collection are displayed in this room. On that wall opposite, you can see a large painting of a garden. Mr. Sumner bought that on a trip to China in 1825. You will also notice several smaller pieces of Chinese art, as well as some portraits of the family. Behind the mansion are the famous Sumner Gardens. Right now you can see a spectacular display of roses. The tea roses are especially nice, and there are many other varieties of roses as well. The guided tour will not continue into the garden. You can enjoy it on your own. Don't forget to stop in at the cafe before you go home for some tasty hot or cold tea and pastries. You enter it through the garden, but it's just behind the living room. There is also a small display there of kitchen tools used in the original mansion kitchen, which I am sure you will enjoy viewing. If you feel disoriented after walking around the gardens, don't worry. Remember that the parking area is just beyond the cafe, so it's a short walk back to your car. Also, please remember that the grounds close at 5 p.m., as we are still on our spring schedule. If you come back next week, the summer schedule will have started and will be open a full 10 hours a day from 10 in the morning until 8 in the evening. Thank you for visiting, and come back anytime. We're open seven days a week. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 240. Section 3. You will hear a panel discussion between the panel moderator and two panelists, Dr. Karen Akers and Dr. Fred Williams, both transportation consultants. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the future of public transportation. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 26 on page 240. Now listen carefully and answer the questions 21 to 26. Dr. Williams and Dr. Akers, I want to thank both of you for coming today and sharing your thoughts on the future of public transportation. Glad to be thank here. Thank you. Let me ask you first, Dr. Williams. Traffic congestion is becoming more and more of a problem and it's spreading. We're used to traffic jams in cities. 
But now we find traffic problems on many major highways that run between cities. What solutions do you see for the future of transportation? Many transportation experts, myself included, are excited about the potential of high-speed trains. These trains are having a great deal of success in Japan and in several European countries as well. They've actually been around for a while, since 1964, in fact. The first high-speed train was put into operation that year. What would the speed be exactly of a high-speed train? Uh, how would you define high-speed train? We usually call a train high-speed if it's capable of traveling at 200 kilometers an hour or faster. That's very fast. It would seem to open up a lot of possibilities for transportation between cities. Yes, that's right. Fifty years ago or more, conventional trains were the major form of transportation between cities. Of course, they weren't high-speed trains, but nobody expected that then. Those old trains provided frequent, reliable, and affordable long-distance transportation, and most people used them. Then things changed. Cars and highways were improved, so more and more people started driving cars. Cars are a great form of transportation. Everybody loves them because they're so convenient. But we usually use cars for local trips, shopping and going to work and things like that. That's true. For long-distance trips, most people nowadays rely on planes. Plane service is more frequent and affordable now than it was in the past. So planes, like cars, have become more convenient for people. Meanwhile, trains have more or less fallen by the wayside as a common means of transportation. But with everybody driving cars and taking planes, we have a lot of congestion. And not just on the roads. Airports have become very crowded, too. Exactly. We have congestion everywhere now, so we need to look at new forms of transportation. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30 on page 240. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. And that's where high-speed trains come in. They offer several advantages over both cars and planes. When you take everything into consideration, getting to the train station, boarding the train, and all that, a high-speed train gets you to your destination just about as quickly as a car. So speed isn't really an advantage. Cost isn't always either. Depending on how many people are traveling with you, a train trip could be more expensive than a car trip. But a train trip is much more relaxing than a car trip. You can read, sleep, eat, whatever, while the train carries you to your destination. And of course, you're never delayed by traffic jams. To my mind, these are great advantages. Yes, I can really see the advantage of the train over the car. But what about planes? Planes are much faster than cars, so that's a big plus for planes. Not necessarily. For trips shorter than 650 kilometers, high-speed trains can actually be faster. Checking in at the airport and going through security takes a long time. You don't have that kind of delay with a train. Also, trains can carry more passengers than planes. They can also offer more frequent service. So for your medium-distance trips, they really are faster than planes. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4 and page 241. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on Albert Einstein. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on page 241.
Now listen carefully and complete the timeline in questions 31 to 40. Today I want to talk about the early life of a man whose name is synonymous with genius, Albert Einstein. He's well known, of course, for his work in physics, especially his theory of relativity. This is a term that everyone has heard, but few lay people, and I do not mean to include you in this group, but few non-physicists understand. Equally incomprehensible to most people is why Einstein, the genius, did so poorly at school. There are some questions, actually misconceptions, about his early life, particularly about his lack of success in school, that I want to clear up for you. Let's look now at some true facts about the life of this famous man. Albert Einstein was born in Germany in 1879. As a child in school, he had a reputation as a slow learner. Now, there were a couple of theories about why he could not keep pace with his classmates. He may have had some sort of learning disability. We don't know for sure. Another theory about his slow learning is that he may have suffered from a condition related to autism. Whether it was a learning disability or not, Einstein himself believed that his slowness actually helped him develop his theory of relativity. He said that he ended up thinking about time and space at a later age than most children, at a time when his intellect was more developed. He didn't even begin to study mathematics until he was 12. There are popular rumours that he failed his math classes, but this is actually not true. Mathematics was a later passion. His first was the violin. Like many intellectuals, Einstein had a passion for music. He started his study of the violin during elementary school and continued playing the violin for the rest of his life. When Einstein was 15, his family moved to Italy. Soon after that, his parents sent him to Switzerland, where in 1896 he finished high school. After graduating from high school, he enrolled in a Swiss technological institute. In 1898, he met and fell in love with a young Serbian woman, Maleva Marek. Marek was a mathematician, and Einstein considered her his intellectual equal. Einstein received a teaching diploma in 1900. The next year, he became a Swiss citizen. Although he had his teaching diploma, he had a hard time finding a teaching job. In fact, he never did find one. A friend's father helped him get a job at the Swiss Patent Office. He began working there in 1902. His job involved reviewing inventors' applications for patents. When he looked over the applications, he often found faults in the applicants' drawings. He would make suggestions so they could improve their designs and better their chances for receiving a patent. The same year Einstein began working at the patent office, he and Maleva had their first child, a daughter. Although they didn't actually get married until 1903, their son was born the following year. There's no record of whether the two children inherited their father's learning disability. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Pause CD for 10 minutes.